I don't know if I've ever met a person who isn't afraid of clowns. Like, it's just flat out creepy to think that there are men out there who think it's normal to put on a bunch of obnoxious makeup and prance around at kids' parties. It's a red flag, and it was definitely a red flag for John Wayne Gacy. This guy used to make appearances at neighborhood get-togethers, charity events, and children's parties as his alter ego, Pogo the Clown. But his cheerful, kid-friendly clown character was all a facade. Because years later, John would be arrested for slaying 33 young boys between the ages of 14 and 21. Most of which were found buried in a crawl space under his house. Yeah, this one's a pretty gruesome story. But I'll try to lighten the mood a bit with an apple pie. John Wayne Gacy was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. He lived with both of his parents and two sisters. Apparently his dad was an alcoholic who had a short temper. And as the only son, John was under a lot of pressure from his dad to be a super manly man who loved hunting and fishing. But John never met those expectations because he always had more of an act for cooking and baking with his mom. John was constantly beat by his father, called names, and was even told he would never be good enough in his father's eyes. What? Okay, I hate the fact that the kid's dad was so bent up about him liking to bake. Like, do you not like to eat cookies and pie? The first thing that raised brows about John happened when he was 13. His sister, Karen, found a pair of girls' underwear in a paper bag in his room. Karen thought it was weird, so she told her mom, who said John apparently had a fetish for this, because he had done that with her clothing before, too. Uh, why is the mom so casual about this? I would be hella skeeved out by that if I were her. When John was 17, he got in a huge fight with his dad over some car drama and ran away. Or actually, he drove away. John's parents hired an investigator and found out that their son was in Vegas working as a mortuary attendant. Okay, out of all of the jobs John could apply for, he ends up going with the one where you sit in a room with a bunch of corpses. That's a bit concerning. After his parents found him, John decided to go back to Chicago, but his family said he seemed a lot different after he returned. Yeah, I'm sure spending your days kicking back with deceased people will change a guy. Anyway, John moved back to Chicago, got a job managing a shoe store, and married one of his co-workers. They had two kids together and moved to Iowa. John's first reported assault happened in 1967 after he moved to Iowa. He lured a 15-year-old boy to his house and physically violated him. He also apparently tricked several other teenage boys into performing physical acts as scientific experiments and would sometimes pay them for the studies. That is so wrong in so many ways. Like, I don't even know what to say at this point other than this guy is sick in the worst way. John wasn't caught until the spring of 1968 when one of the boys told his dad what was going on. He was then arrested for sodomizing two teenage boys, but he claimed he was innocent. During this time, John was very politically active, so he said he must have been set up by his opponent. When John was in prison, all of the guards loved him. They said he was a model prisoner, and apparently he really was on his best behavior because he was released super early. He only ended up serving 18 months of his 10-year sentence, which is not even half of his sentence. And I'd understand him getting released early if he was in jail for theft or the possession of illegal substances substances or something, but for assaulting teenage boys? That's a no from me. And honestly, I want to say I'm shocked at this point, but after hearing quite a few awful crime stories, this seems to be a trend with the officials who determine these things. All right, so after John's short stint in jail, he moved back to Chicago to live with his mom and sisters. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention his dad passed away when he was in jail and it was from cancer, but John convinced himself he was the reason his dad kicked the bucket. He seriously thought he was such a letdown that his dad just decided to peace out. Um, seems like John is being a bit dramatic here because the doctors literally said it was cancer. After moving back to Chicago, John started his own construction company. He was also actively participating in politics and began hosting a lot of parties at his house where he'd dress up as his alter ego, Pogo the Clown. 
Another one of his clown characters was named Patches. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, I need to unpack this for a second. Construction, politics, parties, and clowns. And of all the names he could give his creepy clown personalities, he chooses Pogo and Patches. And why do you need two different characters? Well, apparently Pogo and Patches were a hit with the kids because John started getting hired to make appearances as these clowns at charity events, kids' parties, and other shindigs. I'm guessing this was before the majority of people thought clowns were creepy. Which is crazy for me to think about. Like, was there seriously a time when people actually liked clowns? I got a clown-related story. Yeah, I watched It when I was a kid, and I never looked at clowns the same ever again. Enough clown talk. Let's get back to the story. So John ended up getting married a second time. His mom moved out of their house and his new wife moved in with her kids. But John was apparently living a double life because when his wife and kids weren't looking, he would prey on young men. John's wife, Carol, mentioned that he'd often leave the house at night telling her he had something to do or someone to meet up with. A lot of times he would come home with young men that Carol never knew. He would bring them home in his car and take them to the garage. Okay, but how is Carol just letting this go on? Like, did she not ask him what was going on or who these people were? Well, one time when John wasn't there, Carol went to scope out the garage and found some questionable items like mirrors and chains. She also found random men's wallets, IDs, and explicit photos. Finally, Carol asked John what was going on and he told her it was none of her business. Uh, yeah, last time I checked, you guys are married and it's definitely her business to know what's going on at her own house. Damn, this dude is shady. Three years into her marriage with John, Carol filed for divorce and moved out. John then turned his focus to his construction company. And the super sketchy part about his company is he only hired young men. No! He claimed it was because they were cheaper to employ, but later we find out John had ulterior motives. In 1975, John had a weird encounter with one of his employees, Tony. John showed up at Tony's house unannounced. Play wrestled him and put him in handcuffs. Tony was freaked out, but ended up getting out of the handcuffs and shook off the whole thing. Well, until two weeks later, when one of his co-workers, who was also a teenage boy, went missing. When Tony realized his co-worker hadn't been showing up for work, he asked John where he went. John claimed the boy called him and told him that he was moving to Puerto Rico, so he wouldn't be working for the construction company anymore. But around the same time, Tony noticed John's garage floor had just been redone. He asked John about the new concrete, who said he repaired the floor because it was cracked. That's a bit sus. A boy goes missing and the room where his creepy clown boss was known for having boys in, just got new floors? Something must have gone down because who really cares that much about their garage floor? Well, the boy was eventually reported as missing and his parents begged officers to investigate John, but they never did. In January of 1977, another teenage boy went missing in Chicago. Okay, what is going on here? This can't be a coincidence. It was a 19 year old man who was also named John. So we'll call him John S and our clown man, John G. So John S hadn't shown up for work two days in a row. One of those days was payday which he never missed. I mean, I never miss a payday either. So if John S wasn't there to get that dough, something must be wrong. His family was concerned, so they reported him as missing. Officials knew that John S was on a date the night he disappeared. Later, they pieced together that the teenage boy was in the car with his date when he got pulled over by what he thought was a cop. But it was actually John G, AKA Clown Man, pretending to be a cop. He drove an unmarked car with red lights on top and was later known for pulling young men over, telling them that they were out past curfew and handcuffing them in the back seat of his car. But at the time, investigators didn't know any of this. So John S was just reported as missing and it was left at that. In 1978, another teenage boy went missing in Chicago. 
Seriously, this is getting ridiculous. How did the police not know all of these were connected? And how did they not keep a closer eye on the scary clown man who only hired teenage boys and had a record of assaulting young men in the past? That seems like he'd be a pretty clear suspect. Okay, so this kid who went missing was a 15-year-old boy named Robert. He was talking to his boss about a remodeling project at the drugstore he worked at when John came up to him. John told Robert that his company hired teenage boys and paid them at least $5 an hour. This was almost double what he was currently making, so his ears perked up. When Robert's mom came to pick him up that night, he told her he was going to talk to some guy about a job opportunity and he'd be back in a few minutes. But he never returned. And if you haven't already guessed, the guy he went to talk to was John. After 15 minutes passed, Robert's mom started freaking out. She couldn't find him anywhere. So she drove to the police station and filed a missing persons report. She knew he was kidnapped by someone because he wouldn't just run away like that. Investigators were tipped off by Robert's boss that the boy was last seen talking to John. And once the officers looked up John in the system, they found his previous charge of sodomizing young men. OMG, how were they not aware of this before? Like, how did this dude fly under the radar for years without being pinpointed down as a creep? Okay, so officials were certain John had something to do with Robert's disappearance. They show up at his house and begin to ask John some questions about the boy. John claimed he had nothing to do with Robert's disappearance, but when they searched his house, things started to look really bad for John. Detectives found a panel on the floor that seemed a bit off, so they picked it up to reveal a trap door. Oh no. I am not liking where this is going. They opened the trap door and crawled down to check things out, but they didn't find Robert anywhere. Oop, false alarm. Even though they didn't find Robert, officials did find a handful of suspicious things in John's home. They found several police badges, a pistol, a syringe and needle, handcuffs, adult films, bottles of Valium and Atropine, a bunch of driver's licenses that didn't belong to John, and the sketchiest of all, a high school class ring with the initials JS inside. If you've already forgotten, the teenage boy who went missing one year earlier was named John S. Investigators were able to identify the ring as that same John S's from the previous story. The investigators then called John S's family and found out the boy had been missing. This this is when the officers started to freak. Everything was adding up and John G, the clown man, became the leading suspect in John S and Robert's disappearances. So officers needed to search his house again, but they had to request another warrant. In the meantime, they took turns parking outside of John G's house to keep watch. And John tried to schmooze them into thinking he was a great guy. He would invite them inside, buy them drinks, and would talk at length about his charitable work, including his whole clown act. Which I feel like by telling the cops you dress up as a clown for kids hurts your case more than it helps it, but whatever. Well, when one of the officers was inside the house, he went to the bathroom and reported the smell of a deceased body. With that officer's claim, the second search warrant was granted, and investigators went back to search John's house on December 21st. They went straight for the crawl space under the trap door, because they knew there had to be something down there. I mean, why else would this lowlife have a trap door, especially with his history? Well, that day, officials uncovered the bodies of three young boys, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. John was immediately arrested and taken taken into custody. During his interrogations, John admitted to executing at least 33 young boys. He told officials that over 20 of them were buried under the crawl space in his house, and at least five of them were thrown into a nearby river. Um, how is he gonna casually say he took the lives of 33 boys? And how was none of this discovered until now? They didn't think to investigate things way back when Tony noticed the newly paved garage after his co-worker disappeared? And to have that many bodies in a house for no one to notice until it gets to double digits is pretty damn disturbing. I'll spare you the details, but investigators continued to search John's house and it was rough. They eventually found 20 26 bodies under the crawl space and three 
more in other parts of the house. One of the victims was identified as John S., and another as Tony's friend who went to Puerto Rico. But get this, his name was John too, which could just be a coincidence because it's a pretty common name, but I still think it's pretty freaky. <laughs> A few of the other victims were recovered from a nearby river, but Robert still hasn't been found to this day. But investigators did find Robert's jacket in John's home, so they concluded he was one of John's many victims. In 1980, John went to trial for all 33 executions. During his trial, John claimed he had multiple personality disorder. He said he had four different characters, John the contractor, John the active politician, Pogo the clown, and a police man who he called Bad Jack. He claimed Bad Jack was responsible for his crimes. Dude, let it go. There's no way you're getting out of this one. OMG. Well, after a three hour deliberation, the jury found John guilty on all 33 counts. At the time, this was the highest amount of convictions any person in the US had received. Okay, I know three hours is normally a short time for jurors to make their decision, but I feel like it would take me three seconds to determine this jerk is guilty. And finally, in 1994, John was executed by lethal injection. Action. And thank God he was, because I am so tired, tired of hearing about all of his horrendous acts. They're sickening. It's so ridiculous that he wasn't caught earlier or even kept in prison longer the first time. And my heart goes out to all of the families of his victims. I hope they're able to find some comfort in knowing this atrocious man is no longer alive. Well, now I know why clowns are considered creepy. And I need something to keep my mind off of this story. A slice of pie should do the trick. Stay safe out there, and thanks for watching. Many of us will end up in a hospital at some point of our lives, trusting our doctors and nurses to provide us with the care that we need to get healthy. But what if that weren't the case? What if you were unfortunate enough to encounter someone who abused their position to hurt you? Today, we're gonna to talk about Beverly Allett, the nightmare nurse whose victims were under her care during her time in a children's ward in England. That's right, not patients, victims. Hello, I'm your host, Sam, and welcome back to Killer Bites. In 1991, nurse Beverly Allett murdered four children and attacked nine others in her care. Before she became the serial killer nightmare nurse, Beverly Allett was just another small town girl from Lincolnshire County, England. Allett was born on October 4th, 1968. By all accounts, her family was normal, but as she approached adolescence, young Beverly began to struggle. At around 10 years old, she started wearing a bandage to school to get sympathy. She noticed that she got attention for this and developed a habit of faking injuries. She even went as far as making a DIY plaster cast. When people started to get used to the fake cast, she started to harm herself to get more visible injuries. According to the prevailing theory, what eventually developed into Munchausen by proxy started as Munchausen syndrome, a mental illness where someone willfully makes themselves ill for sympathy or attention. Someone with this condition is aware that they are not sick, but are driven to harm themselves or exaggerate illness in order to get what they want. She was lonely during her teenage years and spent most of her time moving from doctor to doctor. As soon as one suspected that she might be faking it, she would look for a new one. Her commitment to this went so far that she was able to have a perfectly healthy appendix removed and then picked at the sutures to complicate her recovery. What kind of normal parents see their child going through this and then don't get her help? Due to her barely attending school because of her undiagnosed Munchausen syndrome, her grades suffered. Just when it seemed that she had no future after graduating at 17, a family friend who was a nurse helped enroll her in a vocational nursing school. It was there that her predisposition for harm and morbid interest in medicine began to fester. While in nursing school, she worked at a local pub where she lied so much to the regulars that they nicknamed her The Fable. She met Stephen Briggs at the pub when she was 19 and they had a very brief marriage. Stephen later revealed that they divorced because Beverly was physically and verbally abusive. She 
was also a compulsive liar. The lie that broke their marriage was when she told him that she had been raped and she was pregnant with the rapist baby. When Stephen realized this wasn't true, he was shocked. On top of the abuse that he had suffered, lying to this extent crossed the line. After their breakup, her Munchausen syndrome clearly took a turn. Her last year in school, she reportedly took 160 sick days. When she moved into the nurse's dormitories that year, strange things started to happen. And one of the worst things was that someone smeared feces all over the communal kitchen's oven. She also did bizarre things using medical equipment. One time she injected a syringe full of water directly into her breast, making it abnormally large. The combination of strange behavior like this and missing nearly half of her training left her as the only trainee not offered a permanent position. They did want to offer her something, so they gave her a six month temporary contract at the children's ward at Grantham Hospital, also known as Ward 4. The fact they put their least competent nurse in charge of children blows my mind. One of the nurses who already worked there said it was unusual that they hired a nurse with zero experience with children and that they would usually need someone with at least a year of additional training. Then she admitted that because they were so short staffed, they were grateful for the extra hand. Beverly Allett's first shift on Ward 4 was February 18th, 1991. She was 22 years old. It was a small hospital that staff described as a nice place to work and they saw their other employees as family. Her superiors recognized her enthusiasm, especially because she arrived during a surge of winter illnesses that had them unusually busy. Liam James Taylor, a seven week old baby with pneumonia, was sent to Ward 4 where he ended up under Nurse Beverly's care. She comforted the exhausted, distraught parents and then she told them that their tiny baby was safe and that they could go home and get some rest while he stayed in the hospital. The next day, they returned to the hospital only to find that Liam was worse. He had suffered a respiratory attack during the night. Nurse Beverly volunteered to stay the additional night to look after him even though she wasn't scheduled and that she wouldn't be paid for it. In the next 24 hours, he had three more respiratory attacks. He was resuscitated each time, but on the third attack, the machines monitoring his vitals didn't sound the alarm. Nurse Beverly happened to rush in and found him after he had gone into cardiac arrest for the third time. He was pale, his lips were blue, and he was covered in red splotches. He was only seven weeks old and suffered severe brain damage. His parents were forced to make the unthinkable decision to take him off of life support. Baby Liam's death was a devastating blow to his parents and the hospital, but this was only the first of a series of tragic events that followed. Two weeks later, on March 5th, 1991, Timothy Hardwick, an 11-year-old with cerebral palsy and epilepsy, had a seizure at school and was admitted to the Ward 4 to be monitored. After only a couple hours at the hospital, he went into sudden cardiac arrest, just like Liam Taylor before. He stopped breathing, and the team of doctors weren't able to bring him back. At 6.15 that evening, Timothy Hardwick was pronounced dead. This shocking death came out of nowhere. The doctors did an autopsy to see if they could find a cause, but the results were inconclusive, so they decided that the cardiac arrest was related to his epilepsy. A week before Timothy Hardwick's tragic death, a 15-month-old baby named Kaylee Desmond had been admitted with a chest infection. She had made a recovery and Nurse Beverly was assigned to help collect her things. Out of nowhere, the infant went into cardiac arrest two times in under an hour. Because she had two attacks in a row, the doctor sent her to the nearby Nottingham Hospital where there were more robust treatment options. The doctors at Nottingham thoroughly looked into how an otherwise healthy baby recovering from a chest infection could go into cardiac arrest. After examining Kaylee Desmond, they found nothing except a puncture mark and an air bubble in her armpit, which they chalked up to an accidental infection from the hospital. Kaylee survived, but she was never the same. She has severe PTSD and a disability from the lack of oxygen to her brain during the two cardiac arrests. Another two weeks later, a five-month-old baby named Paul Crampton was being monitored in Ward 4 after recovering from a chest infection. What was supposed to be a day or two visit to make sure this baby had a full recovery turned into an absolute nightmare. Within a few hours of him being admitted, Paul Crampton had gone into sudden cardiac arrest. The doctors rushed to him and they were able to save him. While they are running diagnostics to try and figure out what happened, he went into a second cardiac arrest. They resuscitated him again, but the second time he was left in a severely weakened state. They tried giving him glucose and he was able to recover. The speedy recovery struck the doctors as odd, so they kept him for a few more days to monitor him. A few days later, just as baby Paul was about to go home, he went into a third cardiac arrest. This time, they decided to transport him to the better equipped Nottingham Hospital. Who jumped at the chance to heroically stay by his side with his mother in the ambulance? 
none other than nurse Beverly Allett. When the results came back from the lab, they were shocked to find that Paul Crampton's blood insulin level was at 500. The normal amount for a baby his age is between 10 and 15. Paul Crampton made a full recovery and never suffered a cardiac arrest or insulin related problems for the rest of his life. The day Paul Crampton went home with his family, five-year-old Bradley Gibson was admitted to Grantham Hospital to be treated for a chest infection. Despite being sick, he had a charming personality that endeared him to the nurses. They had him on an IV for antibiotics, and that night Bradley complained that the IV was hurting him. Nurse Beverly went to his room to help. When she was there, he slumped over, stopped breathing, and his heart stopped. The team hurried in to resuscitate him, and they had to use an adult dosage of shocks for 30 minutes to save his life. They ran tests and found the same abnormally high insulin levels in his blood as Paul Crampton. But because the tests were done at two different hospitals, no one was communicating this pattern that was developing. Meanwhile, that evening, Bradley Gibson went into cardiac arrest for a second time. Nurse Beverly rushed to his side and the team resuscitated him again. This second event got him transferred to Nottingham for more expert care. And just like the others who made it there, he survived but suffers to this day. He couldn't use his legs until after years of physical therapy. He couldn't control his bladder for a number of years afterwards and he had reoccurring nightmares. All of these strange cases happened in only the first month that Beverly Allett was placed in Ward 4. This pattern baffled everyone but no one had any explanation for what was happening. On March 22nd, just over two weeks after Timothy Hardwick's death, Yik Hung Chan, a two-year-old also known as Henry, was taken to the hospital after he fell and cracked his head. Nurse Beverly attended to his fractured skull and within hours of arriving at Ward 4, he suddenly stopped breathing. Just like the other cases, the staff rushed to him and he was sent to Nottingham Hospital. He made a recovery and never had another cardiac arrest. Just like Kaylee, Paul, and Bradley, he was better as soon as he was taken away from Ward 4 and the overly attentive nurse who was with them all just before they stopped breathing. Unfortunately, Nottingham Hospital decided this random cardiac arrest was due to his skull fracture. At this point, it literally blows my mind that the hospitals are not picking up on a pattern. But sadly, the next victim never made it to the larger hospital. On April 1st, 1991, Becky and Katie Phillips were prematurely born twins, only nine weeks old, that ended up in Ward 4. Becky was admitted first because of severe stomach issues and a small baby that's pretty scary, so she was kept under close watch. In just a couple of days, as soon as she was beginning to recover, Nurse Beverly found her not breathing and she was resuscitated. She bounced back quickly from the cardiac arrest and was sent home. Once she was home, however, she went into convulsions and the distraught parents called a doctor to come and examine the newborn. He said her constant crying was colic and told the parents to soothe her as best they could and take her to the hospital the following morning. They went to bed and the next day when they came to the crib, their nine week old baby had died. They were devastated and terrified that Becky's twin Katie might suffer the same fate so they brought her to the hospital to be safe. When they arrived at the children's ward, they were greeted by the familiar and comforting face of nurse Beverly Allett, who assured them she would take care of her. Lo and behold, after only a few hours in the hospital, Katie stopped breathing. Like previous cases, she was treated by doctors, but after going into cardiac arrest twice, they transferred her to Nottingham Hospital. Upon arrival, the doctors examined the baby and found that she had five broken ribs. No one knew how this happened, but the doctors connected her lungs collapsing to the broken ribs. The doctor seemed satisfied with this conclusion and somehow still didn't see a pattern of harm being done to the children transferred from Grantham's Ward 4. Katie Phillips survived but was left with cerebral palsy due to the lack of oxygen from her attacks. Despite the diagnosis of a lifelong disability, the grief-stricken parents were so grateful their other daughter lived that they asked nurse Beverly Allett to be Katie's godmother. Allett was that convincing as the caring nurse she pretended to be. Beverly Allett went above and beyond, volunteering her time to care for these patients so no one suspected that she was harming them. A small boy named Patrick Elstone was the last victim in a string of near identical attacks. He stopped breathing, turned blue, and it was Nurse Beverly who happened to be there despite the monitors he was connected to not alerting the rest of the staff. On April 22nd, 15-month-old Claire Peck was brought to Ward 4 after an asthma attack. Claire had suffered from asthma since her birth and the staff knew her very well, but this was the first time that she had been in while Nurse Beverly was on staff. She was put on a ventilator and was watched over by none other than Nurse Beverly while Claire's parents went to an office to talk to the doctors. And after only a short time, the baby had two cardiac attacks. The first she recovered from, but the second one left her too weak to survive. Her heart stopped 
and she was pronounced dead. Her grieving parents were at the bedside as she passed away. The staff who knew Claire were devastated and remembered this as the saddest day they had witnessed at Grantham Hospital. Her death was ruled by the coroner as natural causes, but a pediatric consultant named Dr. Porter was concerned by the number of infant deaths due to cardiac arrest in the hospital over the past couple months. He filed a formal inquiry thinking that this was a case of the hospital's operations, but never expecting the terrible truth behind these deaths. Dr. Porter came up with a list of the 13 children from the past two months prior that suffered similar fates. They had all stopped breathing, turned blue, and followed a matching but random pattern. He brought this to the police and told them that he had no proof, but that he knew something wasn't right. The police looked at the report and deemed it a staff issue, not a criminal case. They did, however, open a formal inquiry. After visiting the hospital, Superintendent Stuart Clifton saw that something suspicious was going on, despite everyone else thinking that there was nothing. He knew that there was foul play. Stuart Clifton thought that if there was even a chance that someone was harming children, this was worth looking into. The police became a constant presence at the hospital in order to investigate the case. They started by interviewing everyone that worked at Ward 4. The nurses went first, and Beverly Allett was one of the earliest interviews. The police remembered her as warm, enthusiastic, and passionate about her job. At this point in her life, she has perfected the art of creating the illusion of the caring nurse. Her interview went off without a hitch. Meanwhile, another detective, Neil Jones, was able to locate a fridge at Grantham Hospital where blood samples were being stored. This allowed him to go through all the blood samples. He managed to recover nine test tubes out of the 13 children that were attacked. Every one of the blood tests showed extremely high insulin levels. Each child that had suffered a sudden cardiac arrest or stopped breathing had abnormally high levels of injectable in their system. The investigators feared that someone in the hospital could have been intentionally overdosing these children with insulin. The police went to the hospital to find out where the insulin was stored. Turned out, the key that normally locked the fridge containing insulin and other went missing a couple months prior. The last person who was known to have the keys was, any guesses? Nurse Beverly Allen. The police compiled all the tests and case files. They discovered that all shared one thing. Nurse Beverly Allett had been working on the days of the assaults. Remember, she had only been working there for two days before the first attack. This placed her squarely as the prime suspect in the case and the authorities acted quickly to prevent any further harm. They started to look into Beverly Allett's personal life and they quickly saw that she had Munchausen syndrome. Once harming herself was no longer an option, she developed Munchausen by proxy. By proxy means instead of harming yourself for sympathy or attention, you harm another. This is particularly troubling because the caretakers, while being the cause of the harm, appear externally caring and loving. On May 1st, 1991, at 7 a.m., the police arrived at Beverly Allett's house to arrest her. They didn't have a lot of evidence, so they had to be careful. They were officially arresting her for stealing the key to the fridge where the insulin was stored and the attempted murder of Paul Crampton. They took her to the police station for an interview, and while Stuart Clifton expected the young woman to give a full confession, her demeanor was strangely calm and confident and she committed fully to her caring nurse role. She was clear-headed. It was almost as if she expected this and planned for it. While she was being held, officers went to her house and they found some damning evidence. The missing parts of the nursing log, specifically Paul Crampton's files, were there along with a syringe. The police brought a psychiatrist to speak with Beverly Allett and confirm the mental illness they suspected she had. The psychiatrist agreed with their suspicions and thought that her Munchausen syndrome started in elementary school. She was converted to Munchausen by proxy when she realized that she couldn't continue to work and be ill. When she discovered that she could be praised for saving a sick child by their parents, things clicked into place. She harmed these children so that she could save the day. The psychiatrist also said she had a personality disorder that allowed her to do this for so long without realizing the consequences. It was clear to the police that she wouldn't confess to this. After holding her for 72 hours, the police didn't have enough evidence to hold her, so they had no other choice than to release a suspected child murderer. While Stuart Clifton and the police investigated other cases to find more evidence, Beverly went to live with a close friend, Tracy Jobson, along with her 14-year-old brother, Jonathan, and her mother, Eileen. As soon as Beverly Allett left the hospital, the mysterious attack stopped. When she showed up at the Jobson, strange things started happening. Someone put bleach in Jonathan's bed and their family dog was poisoned with pills. After staying with them a few days, Tracy Jobson's brother, Jonathan, got incredibly sick while they were out shopping. He had a hypoglycemic attack. Jonathan told Eileen that Allett gave him a juice that tasted funny. When Eileen figured out that she had given her son insulin poisoning, she called the police. By November 1991, the police had enough evidence 
evidence to charge Beverly Allett with four counts of murder, eight counts of attempted murder, and one count of grievous bodily harm. When she was brought in for an interview this time, she had clearly been advised by a lawyer and gave a deadpan no reply when asked anything. Over the next 15 months, Beverly Allett was held at Wakefield Prison while she awaited her trial until February 15, 1993. She pleaded not guilty and refused to take the stand. In fact, citing illness, Beverly only attended less than half of the trial. During the trial, prosecutors brought troubling new information to light. It turned out that not only was she poisoning these small children, she was abusing them. Moments after inflicting terrible suffering, she would put on a kind nurse persona and ingratiate herself to her victim's parents. The prosecution also found that every time the monitors had been malfunctioning, as you might suspect, it was because Beverly Allett had been turning them off. In addition, when the children were being resuscitated with oxygen, she would pinch the oxygen tubes to prevent them from getting what they needed to recover. The prosecution's case was airtight. The jury convicted her of all 13 counts and she was given 13 life sentences. The judge called her an evil woman and not once has she expressed any remorse for what she did. She was sentenced and sent to Holloway Prison to serve out her time. During the trial, she didn't meet the criteria that she was mentally ill. After being at Holloway only a week, she refused to eat or drink and then she was moved to Rampton Secure Hospital. Now 55 years old, her minimum sentence tariff of 30 years expired in 2021, and if she is deemed able to transfer to a prison, she will be able to apply for parole. One of the victims, Kaylee Asher, who is now 31, fears that Beverly Allett will come back to get her if she's ever released. The children's wing at Grantham Hospital, also known as Ward 4, was shut down after the trial, but the trauma of her actions remains. Since she has never given an explanation, we will forever be left wondering why she committed these heinous acts. Let us know in the comments what you think. Was she mentally ill or was she a cold-blooded killer? Thank you for watching this episode of Killer Bites. I'm Sam, and we'll see you next time. Welcome to Killer Bites, the true crime show where we sink our teeth into the twisted tales of history's most notorious serial killers. Today we're dishing up a chilling case that will send shivers down your spine, the notorious Green River Killer. Imagine the seemingly serene landscape in Washington state, where the tranquil waters of the Green River hide a bone-chilling secret. Instead of a culinary adventure, this story serves up a sinister spree of violence and terror. I'm Lucy, and let's get into the story. Our killer had a taste for young women, often targeting vulnerable runaways or workers as his main course. Luring them into his vehicle, he left a trail of fear and devastation in his wake. While the body count rose, a dedicated team of detectives worked tirelessly to unravel the mystery, hungry for justice and determined to bring this predator to a bitter end. Our investigation leads us to Gary Ridgway, an unassuming man who blended into the crowd, masking his insatiable appetite for violence. His deeds would etch his name into the annals of infamy as the Green River Killer. Join us as we sink our teeth in the disturbed mind of the Green River Killer, exploring the bone-chilling details of his crimes, the relentless pursuit of truth by law enforcement, and the lingering impact on the communities he terrorized. The year is 1982. The clouds roll through the state of Washington and everything is quiet except the growing list of missing persons from Highway 99 or The Strip. The Strip was also known as International Boulevard and was frequented by those looking for a bit of adult entertainment in the form of or sex workers. We can't really sugarcoat that one. The strip was overrun with female and male workers alike. With missing persons on the rise, the police had their suspicions, but no real evidence or direction to go to find any of the women on the list. That is, until one of them reappeared. July 15th of the very same year, 1982, children were playing by the Green River in Washington and noticed something strange in the water. It was a young woman, a teenager. She was strangled and tied down by her own clothes. Most notably, her ripped denim jeans were wrapped around her neck. Her name was Wendy Caulfield, a 16-year-old runaway from her foster home who would later be marked as the first victim of the Green River Killer. Over the next few weeks, four more bodies would be found on the banks of that very same river. The victims were all within a few feet of each other, so the police assumed that this was the same killer. It would later be confirmed that each of the women were killed in a similar manner, strangulation. This only corroborated the police's assumption and brought the attention from the FBI. This was, in fact, an organized serial killer. August 15, 1982, three more bodies were found. Marsha Chapman, age 31, was found in shallow water. Her legs pinned down by rocks, all except one, her arm, the current whipping it around in the water. She was practically waving for help. Beside her, the body of 17-year-old Cynthia Hines. 
And in the undergrowth nearby, 16-year-old Opal Mills, bruised arms and legs and blue boxers around her neck. The very next day, August 16, 1982, a task force was set up to search for the Green River Killer. The King County Sheriff's Department dubbed the task force the Green River Task Force. Despite its creation and immediate action to investigate the murders, the body count continued to rise. More bodies were found along the riverbank and around the Seattle-Tacoma International Airport. Over the next two years, the Green River Killer would claim over 40 more victims. It wouldn't be until April 30th, 1983, almost a year later, that the police would gain traction on the investigation, finding a suspect in the case that seemed to fit. There were many calls, tips, and anonymous messages left with a task force hotline that pointed the police in all kinds of directions, but one seemed to stick out, Gary Ridgway. And wait till you hear this one. In the spring of 1983, a worker named Marie Malvar, who was just 18 years old, was with her boyfriend at a pickup spot on the Strip in Washington. She was last seen by her boyfriend getting into a paint-patched pickup with a dark-haired man about 30 to 40 years old. The story goes that the boyfriend tailed her and the man for a while. As the 30 to 40 year old suspect drove her out to a wooded area, the boyfriend somehow lost them. Worried that something might have happened, the boyfriend drove around the area looking for the truck and eventually spotted it, parked outside Gary's house. They didn't even go inside his house. It was later discovered that Gary, before his talk with the officers that day, hid scratches all over by rubbing battery acid on his wounds and leaning against a fence. He stated that Marie had put up one of the toughest fights of all his victims. And still, even with the scratches, Gary duped the officers into leaving without looking around or further examination. For all intents and purposes, he seemed normal. Gary was, in fact, the Green River Killer. On the outside, he was a mild-mannered, Bible-thumping husband and family man with three marriages under his belt. But this was his facade. Beneath the surface lay a monster waiting to strike. Forensic psychologist Dr. Helen Morrison had done a profile on Gary Ridgway during her examination of the videos and interviews with him. Through extensive research, she discovered a very likely cause to his peculiar interests. Delving into his history, Gary comes from your average white American family. He was the middle child of a family of five, born to Mary and Thomas Ridgway. His father was a bus driver and his mother was a trophy wife. Everything seemed normal on the outside but it was a different story inside the home. Gary had a bedwetting problem until he was a teenager. And until he was a teenager, his mother had a peculiar way of assisting him. Yeah. You see, this was around the early 60s and his mother was more inclined to wear revealing clothing, opting out of the long dresses and skirts of the time and preferring more provocative or revealing clothing. Anyway, whenever her son would wet his bed, she would personally take him to the shower or tub to clean him off with a thorough wipe down. She would scrub his genitals, and in interviews with Gary, he admitted to having had lustful thoughts about his own mother, dreaming and even fantasizing about her during those times. Dr. Morrison believed this was one major factor in the development of the man that he had ended up becoming. Specifically, this would assist in the development of his insatiable lust and ravenous need to be fulfilled at any and all times of the day. A little Freudian, right? But this wasn't the only thing. His father, Thomas Ridgway, was a bus driver for the city and would often complain and chastise the presence of workers in the area around his route. Gary would get a mouthful of the hate and resentment his father held for the women, hearing his words spill out from an early age. He'd even see his father and mother in domestic arguments, screaming matches as they tore through the house, fighting over many different things, one being that she was a married woman dressed provocatively, gallivanting in swimsuits and f***ing herself for the men in the neighborhood. To his father, she was a similar to the workers on the street. Dr. Morrison would attribute this attitude to the hatred and deep-seated rage Gary had harbored toward sex workers, making it easier for him to see them as objects, things to be used and nothing more. This didn't stop his father, however, from partaking in their services. He would stop off regularly from his route to frequent the entertainers, and there were even times when Gary would be left in the bus while he did so. I mean, talk about traumatizing. This man left his child alone on the bus while he pursued workers. When Gary turned 16, his true colors began to manifest. His curiosity got the better of him, and he had the inkling for the taste of blood. We can only assume why he did it, but Ridgway in high school lured a six-year-old boy out into the woods and stabbed him with a knife. How? The boy was stabbed through the ribs, into the liver, and luckily he survived the attack, but the identity of the culprit was never disclosed. Until now. I mean, I have no words. Who does that? How did he get away with something so heinous? Our guess is that he was testing whether or not he could kill someone. Gary would grow up in that same neighborhood and household until his late teens, where he would then get married to his then-girlfriend, Claudia Craig, and join the Navy. 
He was soon shipped off to Vietnam where he worked on a supply ship and even saw combat. During his stay in Vietnam, he would frequent the local workers and even contracted gonorrhea. It enraged him, but he kept going back and continued without protection. His first marriage ended up only lasting two years, from 1970 to 72, due to both his and his partner's affairs. And yes, he was married again, twice more, in fact. His second marriage was to a woman named Marsha Loren Brown in 1973. During his marriage, Ridgway had become somewhat of a religious zealot. In other words, he found God. He became a big part of the church, reading from the Bible both at work and at home, crying after spirited sermons, going door to door to preach the word. He would even chastise his wife for not following the strict teachings of the pastor at home. From the outside, he became the ideal Christian, except for one thing. He would still regularly go out to pick up workers on the highway. He also tried to get his wife to participate in public in many places deemed inappropriate, the most notable being in the places he would dump the bodies of his victims. Marsha and Gary would later go on to have a son named Matthew Ridgway, born September 1975. He would be Gary's only child in all three of his marriages. Gary and Marsha's relationship would continue until Matthew had turned five when they decided to get a divorce. Matthew, when interviewed, had actually described his father as the model dad. He would show up for him at sporting events, take him camping, play catch, all things you'd expect from the average father. But on the other end, chilling enough, in Gary's confession, he admitted to bringing his son on one of his trips to murder a young girl. Matthew claimed not to remember or realize anything was up, but seeing as he was less than four when it happened, that's understandable. But wow, I mean, Gary really didn't have a lid on his inner demons. He was really just unable to separate himself, even for a moment, with his son to get his fix. Every wife he had and several of his ex-girlfriends reported that his appetite was immense and he would demand several times a day. Many psychological evaluations later, and doctors would chalk the source of this up to his relationship with his hyper mother, specifically the bedwetting and genital washing until he was a teen. The marriage of Marsha and Gary ended in 1981. To many of the investigators and psychologists, it seemed that this really hurt Gary. They believed it's the moment he really began to spiral. It's when his killing spree really started to take off with the first confirmed murder in July of 1982, as described earlier. Remember 16-year-old Wendy Lee Caulfield. His murder spree continued uninhibited for another two years before local law enforcement arrested him in 1982 for soliciting sex workers. He was subsequently released by the police and he continued murdering runaways and sex workers all the same. I'm sure it was just as frustrating then as it is now to hear that he was let go. An officer even approached Gary poking the bear by saying he knew he was the one doing it and that he wouldn't let him get away with such a heinous crime. Gary shrugged him off and went on his way, and he wouldn't be caught for another 18 years. Many other officers agreed with that sentiment, specifically Officer Matt Haney. Assigned to the tip line for the Green River Task Force, Matt Haney's job was to follow up on every lead and or tip received by the tip line, mail or email, and he did just that. And what he found was the most outstanding suspect was none other than Gary Ridgway. In an attempt to get ahead of the police, Gary decided to come to the police's aid in finding the killer. In May of 1984, he went in for a polygraph test conducted by the police. While not admissible in court, the polygraph is enough to provide reasonable suspicion of a criminal to get a warrant and begin a thorough investigation of said person's whereabouts and personal effects. In other words, if they asked Gary if he was the Green River Killer, they could use the test to conduct surveillance, hold him, and get a judge to sign a warrant to search his possessions. Unfortunately for the police, the polygraph of Mr. Ridgway proved inconclusive. He passed it, denying that he was the Green River Killer and walking out still a suspect, but no closer to being arrested. The killer walked in and out of the police's hands and they were unable to do anything. Then, in an unexpected turn of events, with no other leads to go on, the police got advice from a surprising source. Who better to help catch a killer than a killer himself? Ted Bundy stepped forward to assist police in getting into the mind of a killer. For those who don't know, Ted Bundy was one of the most prolific killers in American history, known for his extreme cruelty and the violent natures of his crimes. Similarly to the Green River Killer, his killing spree was directed towards women. Officers didn't initially take him seriously or expect anything from Bundy, but listened anyway and were pleasantly surprised. It's 1986, and at the time, Bundy was already convicted and was awaiting execution on death row when he read about the killings performed by the Green River Killer in the newspaper. It's strange, but he offered to help investigators with the case. So they held discussions with Bundy, who reportedly stated his hypothesis that the killer had likely returned to where he had left his victims to perform 
blacks on the bodies. Disturbing, we know, but it was actually correct. We could chalk it up to Bundy's killer instincts or his intuition, but Ridgway later confirmed it. The story doesn't get any easier either. Gary may have passed the lie detector test, but knew he wasn't in the clear just yet. Ridgway reportedly returned to the dump sites in order to contaminate the scene with DNA evidence in different forms in order to throw authorities off his trail. He would leave things like chewed up gum, hair, wrappers, and half-eaten food at the site in order to incriminate someone other than himself. Then, in 1987, Gary was called in by the police to provide a sample of his saliva in order to get data from the biggest technological advancement in law enforcement since firearms, DNA testing. No, not like what you're thinking of right now. It was the classic DNA testing and mapping. It could basically be used at the time to match a father to a child and hadn't been used for much else. It wasn't until 86 that it was thought to bring in DNA evidence for murders and to assist in solving investigations. And even then, it was similar to guesswork, so people still considered it unreliable. The best the police could do at the time was collect DNA for future matches, and in 1987, Gary complied and submitted his saliva for evidence. This would be his undoing. Sadly, that would be later rather than sooner. It wouldn't be until March 2001 that anything turned up. That's 15 years, 20 in total. Significant advancements in DNA testing and research provided fresh eyes for the case. The Green River Task Force was able to re-examine the little evidence they had collected over the time the Green River Killer was active. Beverly Himmick, a Washington State Patrol Crime Lab forensic scientist, was quoted in the New York Times stating, it was a last ditch effort. We didn't have a lot to work with, but we went through a lot of evidence again. With one girl, we were able to find a few clinging to her pubic hair. DNA profiles from three victims were compared to Ridgway's sample. All three had come back a match to the sample he provided in 1987. Then, on November 30th, 2001, investigators announced the arrest of Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer. It had been nearly 20 years, and finally, one of the most prolific killers in the United States had been captured. At first, he was charged with murder in connection with four victims, Marsha Chapman, Opal Mills, Cynthia Hines, and Carol Ann Christensen. Almost all of these were found in 1983, 18 years prior, failed to forego the death penalty and face only imprisonment. Judith was stunned, defeated, and just plain baffled. The man she loved had raped and killed all of these people. How was she supposed to react and recover from this? Interviews with her show her swimming in guilt and disbelief. It's so easy to fall deeper into despair when she herself, the woman who thought to be closest to him, his wife, couldn't tell. She would recount times when he'd say that he was working late or when he would tell her he was headed to the junkyard to scavenge parts. The look on her face says it all, questions bubbling up. Were those the days he killed someone? Was that a life taken that she missed? There's no way this was easy for her at all. And honestly, you can't blame her. By all accounts, he seemed ordinary. If you saw him on the street, you wouldn't feel intimidated or scared. He seemed like a mild and meek, well-mannered suburban stepdad. I mean, sure, the mustache is a bit of a giveaway, but even his lawyers said that when they met him, he seemed like a man in the wrong place at the wrong time. Truly, his lawyers believed what he had claimed happened. He was guilty of buying the company of sex workers, but he had never kidnapped or murdered them until more DNA evidence came in. After three more hits on his DNA and different victims, Gary began to sweat. Within the week, he broke. His lawyer said that one day he came in, they greeted Gary with smiles, and he stated, oh, you won't be smiling when we're done. Gary confessed he'd been lying to everyone and manipulating them all. Then he said, I killed them all. November 5th, 2003, he pleaded guilty to the 48 charges of aggravated first degree murder and was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Ridgway admitted to killing most of his victims at his house or in his truck, then taking the bodies elsewhere to be disposed of. The bargain stated that he would not be sentenced to death so long as he cooperated with the Green River Task Force, told the truth about his crimes, and assisted the police department in uncovering the rest of the victims not found. Guilty. His actual sentencing was on December 5th that same year. He was given 48 consecutive life sentences. The other stipulation for this was that he would provide information to the authorities on where he hid the bodies of the other victims. A sad fact is that there were so many that for Ridgway, he hardly remembered their faces or their names. So it's possible there are victims he hasn't or won't point out. He was quoted saying, I killed so many women, I have a hard time keeping them straight. Most of the time I killed them the first time I met them and do not have a good memory for their faces. It's just sickening. This was on behalf of the families who didn't receive closure or even get to know where their loved ones' bodies were. 
The police took this opportunity to find them and give these families what little peace they could offer. This was also when the police would truly discover just how heinous Gary Ridgway's crimes were. He used his meek and mousy appearance, as well as the fact that he had a son and family, in order to lull women into a false sense of security. He would show a picture of his son or tell them a bit about his life as a father, provider, family man, and that sex workers would typically be afraid of, so he was easily able to lure them into a false sense of comfort. He would offer to take the women to his house. It was actually his preference. Some would agree, others not so much. The other option was to drive somewhere secluded and get into the canopy over the bed of his truck in order to have there. Once inside his car or in his home, they would have after they'd finish, he would immediately pounce on her, wrap his forearm around her neck, and pull back on her windpipe. He would promise to let them go if they complied, and obviously that was a lie. In his confession, he stated that the only thing he could think of after with these women was, I've gotta kill her, I've gotta kill her, I've gotta kill her. From there, he would choke them out until they died from strangulation. His mode of operation after that would be to load the bodies into the back of his truck with the canopy and drive out to a secluded area in the woods, or if he was already there, he would just take the body out of the truck. When he was with officers, showing them the spots he dumped his victims, he pointed out a hill in particular that he said he would take many bodies to and just roll them down. Watching his interview and footage of his interactions with the police after his convictions is a different picture. The lawyers and officers stated they believe he cried for sympathy as an act. He felt no remorse and merely faked his feelings of sorrow, guilt, and his entire apology. Honestly, in the videos with the police after, Gary doesn't seem at all shaken up. He looks eager to point the cops in the right direction and continuously shows that he just didn't care. After confessing and assisting in finding the bodies of his victims, Gary Ridgway is serving out the remainder of his 48 life sentences behind bars at Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington. Thankfully, many of the families were able to gain a bit of closure and solace in the fact that their loved ones were found and were given the courtesy of peace, even after death. And on that note, my fellow crime enthusiasts, it brings us to the end of our chilling journey into the twisted world of Gary Ridgway, better known as the Green River Killer. We've delved into the dark recesses of his heinous crimes, toyed with the ideas of what could have made the man become the monster he did, and heard the haunting stories of his victims and their loved ones. Let us know your thoughts on Gary's reign of terror. Should he have been sentenced to death? Was the ruling enough? Should they have just charged him for the entirety of the 71 murders he admitted to? I'm curious to read your thoughts. My name's Lucy, and this is Killer Bites. For all things true crime, like and subscribe to our channel, Killer Bites.